Yeah, anyway, I wanted to talk about uh, Genevieve Palumbo, who passed away a couple of weeks ago. We didn't really get a chance on the show either time since she, since she passed away, uh, because she was really one of the most remarkable women I, I've ever met, or the nicest, or, or whatever. You know, they just don't make them like that. Uh, you know, she died in her 100th year. She turned 99, uh, I think in November or something like that. Or Jen? Jen, Jen Palumbo. Uh, formerly Orsini, uh, she was Gen Genevieve Orsini Hardigan Palumbo. She must be related to you, isn't she? No, but I've got a, a story about her that... Uh, oh, go ahead, go when ahead. He, when Elaine was uh, pregnant, pregnant with my first son, she was walking home from the doctor's office right across the street from Orsini's and she passed out. Yeah, Elaine, so, uh, Elaine passed out. Elaine passed out, and Jen ran across the street and took care of her until somebody came along and wow. got her home. Wow. That's, that's the story. That's it. Well, that's a pretty good story. Yeah, it is. But that's the way she was. Uh, uh, I think I'm gonna call this a love story in five acts, uh, because when you're 99, you get a lot of acts. Uh, the first one was kind of a long one. You know, she uh, it, it, she was sharp right up to the end. She went into a coma uh, 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 the morning after uh, being at happy hour with my mother-in-law. Uh, <laughs> but but aside from that, up until that point, you know, uh, absolutely sharp as attack. Remembered everything. She thanked me for the corned beef sandwich I, I brought her five years ago. <laughs> you know, things like that. Uh, it knows the names of all of our kids, you know, like, you know, it's not like we lived with them or lived next door or anything, it's just, you know, everybody was her friend. Uh, she graduated from high school in 1932, which means she was a senior when Kirk Douglas was a sophomore. <laughs> <laughs> and we, you know, we think of him as being the oldest guy in Hollywood, and uh, and she was two years ahead of him. The year of my birth. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. 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 Just think about that. You got a, you got a good eighteen more years to go. Uh, uh, actually, Morris Palumbo was her, was her classmate, as so they ended up being married as uh, elderly people, really, uh, by I most standards. Nice. Yeah. Well, no, they weren't actually. They didn't even they didn't even date in high school apparently. Uh, anyway, her first husband ultimately was uh, Ed Hardigan, and Ed was the son of uh, the chief of detectives of the Amsterdam Police Department, Louis Hardigan. He graduated from high school, I believe, in 1922, the year my father was born. Yeah. You know, I mean. You know, he would have been graduated from high school 92 years ago, yeah. right? Think about that. Uh, anyway, he was, Ed was one of uh, four kids in the family. Uh, none, of the, none of them married for a long time. Uh, he was, uh, I don't know where he was in, in line, but he had a brother uh, who was a priest, who of course didn't get married, and uh, he was off in St. Louis. He had a, a, a maiden sister uh, who ultimately did marry, but well along, you know, not like when she was 18. Uh, and he was, he was something like 37 when World War II breaks out. Uh, so Genevieve is already 10 years out of high school, and they're, they're an item, uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's he's like ten years older than her. She's she's ten years out of high school, and they're still uh, you, know, uh, you know we'll get around to it or whatever. I don't I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know what the circumstances were, but uh, but they were they were definitely an item. Uh, his younger brother, who should have been the guy going to war, uh, gets hit by a train in early 1942 and killed. Uh, and somehow, I mean, he had to have been a volunteer at his age. You know, they were they weren't they weren't drafting thirty seven year olds, right? Right. Uh, and he ends up going into the going into the army in 
September of 1942. I think he left the same day my father did. My father was in the Navy, he was in the Army, so they weren't in the same picture, but I, I'm pretty sure it was either the same day or a day apart. Uh, he's going through basic training with guys that are half his age. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when you're 18 or 19, uh, you can do certain things. When you're 37, not so much. <laughs> and so he's going through the same thing with the, you know, the, 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 the hikes with the full packs and the, and the, the hitting the ground and the, and the manual of arms where, he's, where he says he, you know, he kept, his, his whole body was beat up by moving that rifle around trying to, trying to get the motions right. And he ends up in, not just, you know, uh, some desk job at the Pentagon, he ends up in Merrill's Marauders. Okay, <laughs> the, the, you know, the um, prototype of the Army Rangers, yeah, yeah. right? Now, he doesn't end up going to the front with Merrill's Marauders, but he, he goes through all the, all the training, all the jungle training and everything else. So they send him off to Trinidad for jungle, jungle training. Anyway. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, Ed Hardigan's diary is a huge part of my book. Mm -hmm. And as I've said, it's, it's probably the best written part, with the possible exceptions of the, uh, the senior Gavin Murdoch parts. Uh, uh, Anyway, a, a couple of excerpts from his diary just to show what he was thinking of. Uh, they're, uh, they leave New Orleans heading for Trinidad. I don't even know if they knew where they were going. You know, they're just they're put on a boat, you're going somewhere for more training. Yeah. He says, uh, the first night we slept in a hold down in the middle of the ship, it was stifling. And when 200 sweating men removed their shoes, it wasn't exactly fragrant. <laughs> the portholes had to be closed, of course, at dusk. The entire ship blacked out at night, the submarine menace at that time being no joke. Everybody was a bit jittery. And when the hold light suddenly went out, Shorty, who was sitting on my bunk, put his fingers in his mouth and gave out a long, drawn-out whistle sounding all the world like a shell on its way. <laughs> that didn't help any. Those boys just took off in <laughs> every direction of a hatchway. The rest of the voyage, I spent the nights on deck, listening to the waves lap up against the sides of the ship as we sailed along like three ghost ships. It was pleasant and restful, lying back on your life preserver, looking up at the southern skies, and dreaming of Jenny and home. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Uh, that, uh, I think that's the first time he mentions her in the diary, actually, believe it or not. But, but just lying on your back, looking at the southern skies, dreaming of Jenny and home. And of course, home is a long way when you're heading for jungle training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So they go through all this jungle training, and then one day they get the word they're going, they're going to the front. And they're going by way of the United States. They're going to they're be shipping, shipping them to the United States, and they tell them that uh, then they're going to train across the, cost, across the country, and then I guess they, they, they boated from there to India. From well, the West sure Coast. They didn't train from there. Yeah. Uh, no, but some of the people flew, but he, the, 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 they were they were in boat. Uh, so they 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 kind of tantalizingly hold this. So at this point, they've been they've been gone for over a year uh, from home uh, in a foreign country, uh, uh, Trinidad. You can't even get to. <laughs> you know, if you want to, hey, I'm gonna go uh, gonna go visit uh, at a, uh, no, uh, no, no, it's Trinidad. You know. So, Freaking jungle in the middle of the Caribbean, someplace, I guess, right? Yeah. Anyway, uh, so they're holding this out that maybe you're going to get to go home. But isn't it? It's now Trinidad and Tobago, isn't it? To Trin that, Tobago. That's, Tobago. That's where they got the sleds from, right? Uh, the the, Tobago, the, the Tobago, Tobago sleds. Well, well, those must have been the ones they used in cool runnings. Oh, okay. All right. Just checking. 
things you learn on the show with no name. <laughs> All right. Uh, so some of the guys are told they're not going, and they're, they're, they're all, all hot, and the others are eager to go. And of course, he's by this time 38 or 39, and, uh, and well, what the heck? Uh, and his diary entry says, well, we're all ready. Stein just walked over and knocked the book out of my hand. Just a hangover from last night. What a night. Everybody taking farewell and getting drunk, sympathizing the, with the ones left behind. Toom and Mike didn't make it. They're both broken hearted. In his rage, Connery nearly wrecked the NCO club last night. According to the dope, we, we go all the way by plane, some 7,000 miles. That doesn't happen. There's a chance we may hit the states to be equipped, but I'm not figuring on it. You don't allow yourself to think of home on occasions like this. Too much letdown if it doesn't pan out. But if I could see Jenny for one hour, they can put me in a foxhole for the next two years. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So they go, you know, it goes off the, the Merrill's Marauders do their thing and they're in India for like another year and they finally, they end up going all the way around the world because they, you know, they went across the Pacific but on the way home they were, they actually flew them uh, home by way of what's now Pakistan and, uh, in, and uh, Egypt and, uh, and uh, Morocco and then across the ocean. He catches uh, catches a cold or something, and so when he they, they land in New Jersey, when everybody else is going home, he ends up in the hospital in November of forty four, I think. Uh, and and his diary ends there, but of course I got the rest of the story from Jen, <laughs> and. Uh, late November, he's in the hospital in New Jersey. I think December sixth or something like that. He's in uh, he's in his uniform and she's in her wedding dress. And they, there was no more wait. <laughs> they got they got married the moment he got uh, got home. And I think his brother came from St. Louis to do the wedding. Uh, so they you know I, I say in the book and they lived happily ever after. And uh, that, that's basically true. Uh, you know, had a couple of kids, Jennifer and uh, Michael. Uh, had a lovely house on Division Street where, uh, actually they tore it down to build the housing projects. So, you know, it was, a, it, was, it was just, you know, a great old house with a nice backyard and, and all that. And uh, uh, they lived there until Ed died around 1964, I think. Uh, Jennifer was in high school, was still in high school at the time. Uh, and I met her, Jennifer, in the summer of 65. Ed, Ed was already dead at that point. Uh, when I was 14 doing South Pacific in the summer show, Berta Rose Summer Show, and uh, Jen was in the chorus. This is Jennifer, I mean, not Genevieve. Uh, I don't know why we would ever confuse the, the two Jennies. But, uh, after uh, a couple of Jennies, they all yeah, look alike. Yeah, for a couple of Jennies, they all look alike. Yeah, right. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> anyway, you know, for me, th that was a magical summer. It was the first time I'd been on the stage. We were doing a major musical that was a lot of fun. Great, great songs, great, great everything, you know. Uh, uh, great people working it. Bert DeRose was like, that's the greatest director there ever was. There. Uh, we used to rehearse the show at the American Lithuanian Club. And uh, uh, up until about a week before production when we'd move over to the Lynch stage. Uh, but, uh, it, w it was just a fun summer. My, my sister was playing uh, Emile de Beck's daughter uh, Nagana or whatever the heck her name is. Uh, uh, Frank, Frankie Marcelino was playing Jerome, the, the son. Uh, actually, my sister split the part with Linda McHugh. Uh, the, the one, one did two nights and one did the other one did the, the yeah. other two nights, yeah. Uh, and my, my parents uh, 
my parents came to almost every rehearsal, and uh, Barbara DeRose was there with little Matthew on her lap. He was, he was just a baby at the time. Marty, now a priest, was like, oh, I don't know, seven years old maybe. Yeah, let's see, eight. He would have been eight years old. Uh, so we got all, these, all the kids running around. and uh, many, many nights after the rehearsal, which probably got out over like 8.30 or you know, some crazy time like that. Uh, we'd all walk over to the Hardigan house on Division Street and there'd be a party in the backyard and everybody would be there and uh, Genevieve would be serving, uh, serving their soft drinks and uh, sometimes there'd be pizza and things like that and uh, Rob Constantine who was who was then beginning his uh, career as a folk singer, was usually there with his guitar. He wasn't in the show. He'd just show up with his guitar and, uh, <laughs> and start singing. And, you know, they'd, they'd all do their favorite show tunes and things like that. And, you know, it was, you know cool summer night. It was, it was just magic. And uh, that's where I met Genevieve. And, that's, uh, and meeting Genevieve, you fall in love with Genevieve. And it's as simple as that. She was uh, uh, just absolutely uh, the most wonderful person, and she, you know, she got to know every one of the one of the kids. I mean, she remembered me from that, you know, forever. And uh, I was one of eighty kids in her backyard. You know, it's not like I was standing out in that crowd either, because there were many demonstrative uh, uh, you, you show stood types. Out. You probably stood out. I did not. I absolutely did not. Uh, because the most of them were older, you know. Uh, Jennifer's, you know, four or five years older than me. Four, I guess. Uh, anyway, so so that's that's that that was Act One. Uh, well, Act One up until Ed died. Act Two, Act Two is uh, her long widowhood, where she was just uh, mother to everybody who crossed her path. Uh, uh, Joe Emanuel and his family were, were at the funeral. And, uh, and I had forgotten that they had lived, uh, lived on Pleasant Street at, at one time. I think they may have been next door neighbors to, uh, or, or close to, uh, to them when uh, Jen married Morris Palumbo. And uh, you know, he said, uh, yeah, uh, Genevieve used to uh, babysit my kids. Well, God, she was probably only 85 when she was doing that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Shapers. Uh, uh, so she had this long widowhood that was uh, that was Act Two, and then, and then and then, as I say, in their old age, uh, Morris Palumbo's uh, wife died, and uh, and you know, as I say, they were knew each other from high school. They ended up getting together, getting married, and, and they had to have been in their sixties at that point, I think, at least. Uh, and now she inherits uh, Sandy and Carol, Morris's daughters, mm -hmm. who are who are not little kids or teenagers. They're, they're grown adults at that point. I think they were both married at the time that Gen I'm almost positive they were when Genevieve comes into the family, and she treated them as exactly as though she were they were her own children. Uh, and vice versa. Uh, you know, if, if you read the obituary and uh, heard what everybody was saying, you, you'd swear that Genevieve had four children. Uh, there, there was never any question about it. Uh, uh, Carol and Sandy's kids uh, were her grandchildren. Their, their kids were her great-grandchildren. And, that, you know, that's, uh, you know. Yours, mine, and ours. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was, that was Act Three. And then... Uh, you know, she outlived Morris uh, by quite a few years. He's probably gone, gone at least 10 years, maybe even more than that. I think uh, more than that. More than that. Uh, you know, and uh, she would, you know, up until, well, up until just a few years ago, she was, I mean, she was at least 95 uh, and, and still going to 8 o'clock mass every morning at, at St. Mary's and uh, uh, driving, you know, driving herself. And, you know, eventually, uh, you know, it happened. She, you know, fell at home, and she ends up in uh, Hillcrest, and eventually uh, Wilkinson. But yes, wonderful to the end. Wonderful to the end. Yeah. Anyway, 
uh, a loving, lovable, uh, perfect woman. And, you know, it kind of, knowing people, that people like that exist makes life very tolerable. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And so, enjoyable. You know, so, that's my, well, the fifth act started a couple of weeks ago. And that one is going on forever. So here's to Genevieve Palumbo, one of the greatest ladies I've ever known. <laughs>